Um, it's all about uh, creating a community of people online supporting each other and staying alive. It's art focused. Um, there's a section of the site that's your stories where people write in and share their stories and their stories, stories help other people. If you or anyone you know could benefit from the site, it's stayherewithme.com and um, please check it out. And this poem um, was a poem that I first read. Kels was with me the first time I read it, and um, we start. We've been having conversations with with people for two years about this and uh, this sort of stuff. So, gosh, I shouldn't say two years. Maybe thirteen years. Um, but anyway, one more thing I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> All this stuff in the beginning of this poem, this happened, the amount, I live in Boulder, Colorado, which if you know anything about it, it's a bizarre place. It's sort of a lot of rich hippies, um, how else do I describe it? Uh, when Sandy moved there, she called it fucking white Boulder. Um, so she came from LA and she just, anyway, so it's sort of, you'll get the gist when I start reading the poem. <laughs> No, I'm going to tell you one more thing. So one of the things, so the the original list of stuff that came that 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 came out of me going to search for somebody that would help me be happy um, was just so bizarre. And one thing that I leave out of, which I think is the best story, I don't know how it didn't make it in here, um, was I was doing this thing. I was I was doing this. Uh, I went to see this woman because I was having all this anxiety and depression and stuff. And um, I went to see her, and she was a shaman. I have to point out she was a white shaman. I don't know why I have to tell you that before I describe the scenario. So white shaman running around me, and um, I'm naked in her back. Yard. She is throwing herbs at me and chanting, and her assistant, um, her assistant is running around and throwing herbs at me. And I'm thinking, if anyone I knew fucking saw me doing this, I would die. I was like just mortified if anybody saw me doing this. And while the assistant is throwing herbs, she goes, "I really love your poetry." And I'm like, "No!" Okay, the nutritionist said I should eat root vegetables. Said if I could get down 13 turnips a day, I'd be, I would be grounded, rooted. Said my head would not keep flying away to where the darkness lives. The psychic told me my heart carries too much weight. So for twenty dollars, she'd tell me what to do. I handed her the twenty. She said, "Stop worrying, darling. You will find a good man soon." <laughs> the first psychotherapist said I should spend three hours a day sitting in a dark closet with my eyes closed and my ears plugged. I tried it once, but couldn't stop thinking about how gay it was to be sitting in the closet. <laughs> Yogi told me to stretch everything but the truth, said to focus on the out-breath, said everyone finds happiness, that they can care more about what they give than what they get. The pharmacist said Kalanapin, Lamictal, Lithium, Xanax, the doctor said an antipsychotic might help me forget what the trauma said. The trauma said, don't write this poem. Nobody wants to hear you cry about the grief inside your bones. But my bones said, Tyler Clemente dove into the Hudson River, convinced he was entirely alone. My bones said, write the poem to the lamplight, considering the riverbed, to the chandelier of your faith, hanging by a thread, to every day you cannot get out of bed, to the bullseye of your wrist, to anyone who has ever wanted to die. I have been told sometimes the most healing thing we can do is remind ourselves over and over and over other people feel this too. The tomorrow that has come and gone, and it has not gotten better. When you are half finished writing that letter to your mother that says, I swear to God, I tried. But when I thought I'd hit bottom, it started hitting back. There is no bruise. Like the bruise, loneliness kicks into the spine. So let me tell you, I know there are days when it looks like the whole world is dancing in the streets when you break down. Like the doors of their looted buildings, you are not alone. And wondering who who will be convicted of the crime of insisting you keep loading your grief into the chamber of your shame? You are not weak just because your heart feels so heavy. I have never met a heavy heart that was in a phone booth with a red cape inside. Some people will never understand the kind of superpower it takes for some people 
to just walk outside some days. I know my smile looks like a gutter on a falling house, but my hands are always holding tight to the ripcord of believing a life can be rich like the soil, can make food of decay, turn wound into highway, pick me up in a truck with a bumper sticker that says it is no measure of good help to be well adjusted to a sick society. I have never trusted anyone with the pulled back bow of my spine the way I trust the ones who come undone at the throat, screaming for their pulse to find the fight to pound. Four nights before Tyler Clemente jumped from the George Washington Bridge, I was sitting in a hotel room in my own town, calculating exactly what I had to swallow to keep a bottle of sleeping pills down. What I know about living is the pain is never just ours. Every time I hurt, I know the wound is an echo, so I keep listening for the moment when the grief becomes a window, when I can see what I couldn't see before through the glass of my most battered dream. I watched a dandelion lose its mind in the wind, and when it did, it scattered a thousand seeds. So the next time I tell you how easily I come out of my skin, don't try to put me back in. Just say, here we are, together at the window, aching for it to all get better, but knowing there is a chance our hearts may